Beware the beast man, for he is the devil's pawn. Alone among God's primates, he kills for sport, or lust, or greed. Yea, he will murder his brother to possess his brother's land. Let him not breed in great numbers, for he will make a desert of his home and yours. Shun him. Drive him back into his jungle lair, for he is the harbinger of death. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. There is grandeur in this view of life. Welcome to Evolution Talk with Rick Coast, an introduction to the oldest story ever told. Those two quotes at the beginning of the episode say a lot. One was from the 1968 film Planet of the Apes. The other was spoken by J. Robert Oppenheimer himself, referring to how he felt when the first atomic bomb was tested in 1945. We've come a long way, both when we started our journey down the Hominin River in search of ancestors, as well as a species. We, and by we I mean the Homo sapiens species, began our exploration of the world 300,000 years ago. Modern humans, those ancestors who were anatomically like us, appeared on the scene 200,000 years ago. You'll also hear them referred to, and us, as Homo sapiens sapiens. We are the only ones left standing, as far as we know. We have large brains, we have a thin skull, and a flat vertical forehead. Our jaws aren't as strong or as robust as the robust Australopithecine, but we make do. Having the ability to cook and well, process food allows us the luxury of smaller teeth and jaws, if you want to call it a luxury. It's not better or worse, it's just different. It's how we've evolved. Think for a moment about some of the ancestors and hominin cousins we've met along the way. There's the Sahelanthropus chidensis and Auroran tugenensis. One or the other stands literally at the very start of the hominin river itself. Then there's the Autopithecus, both Kadaba and Ramidus, whom we've met and passed along the way. And we can't forget Lucy and her fellow Australopithecine. Then there's Paranthropus, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus. And it, of course, doesn't end there. As we've learned, there are many tributaries that have long since dried up, erasing all traces of the hominins who traveled along their waters and the shores. We'll never know about them. We'll never know how they lived or the challenges that they faced. We know a little bit more, although not a lot, about the ones we shared this planet with at one time. Those we might have called friends or even fought against. Other hominins like the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, and the Homo floresiensis. Of those cousins, the Neanderthals may have been the most like us. Fashioning tools, spears, shaping shells and bones into pieces of art, or drawing on cave walls. They may have even gathered around the fire and told stories about the hunt of the day and what they were afraid of. Again, we'll never know. We can only imagine, gently handle their bones, and wonder when the last embers of their campfire stopped glowing. The thing is, we're not alone in this world. In the past 24 hours, right from this window that I'm sitting next to, I've seen deer, wild turkey, squirrels, and hawks. We're surrounded by creatures both great and small. And sometimes I wonder, what they think of us. Other than trying to avoid us, I'm sure they don't think much of us at all. They have other things to worry about, like predators and their next meal. We, on the other hand, have 
carved out quite a niche for ourselves on this world. We communicate with one another, we trade goods and build communities. We're creative, we sing, we dance, we gather as families and friends to share what we've learned and to spend time together. In our quieter moments, we look around and ask what it's all about. We tend to spend our evenings catching up with the day's data and downloading everything and getting ready for the next day. In the old days, we used to sit outside and look at the stars and contemplate who we are as a species and why we're there and what, what we're doing and, and think the important things. That's me, Leakey. We've met her and her family along the Hominin River over the last few episodes, and they've discovered quite a lot of the fossils that we've talked about. As a child, I used to contemplate the stars and what might be up there that we can't see, just as Dr. Leakey just said. Do I now? Well, sure, but not as much as I used to. There are distractions that are just too many to mention most days. At the end of it, I forget about the stars or the animals in my backyard and in the woods behind my house, and I pass the rest of the time with my wife before going to bed. It's easy to forget about the bigger picture when there are so many smaller pictures to focus on. With so many distractions, the world around us fades into the background. It becomes essentially background noise. As we rush along the Hominin River, we might fail to notice something. Ahead of us, the river is narrower than it used to be. The tributaries are gone. This great river, the one that got its start a little over six million years ago, might be coming to an end, and much sooner than we realize. With six million years behind us, there may not be more than a century or two in front of us. People are always trying to find out why are humans unique? Why are they different? But in actual fact, if you compare humans with other animals and you start saying, oh, well, we have language or we have technology or we have this or that, bipedality, you can always find another species that does all these things. But the one thing in which we are absolutely and completely unique is that we are the only species that's destroying our environment, our life support system, the biosphere, the thing that keeps us here. And why are we doing it? And why don't we realize? And why don't we do something to stop it? It's a good question. We're not doing anything to stop it because it doesn't feel real. Not when we have so many other things to worry about. The fact that we are destroying the planet, it seems kind of too big for one person to worry about. But there are those who are, like Dr. Leakey. They are trying to warn us. Remember Oppenheimer's words at the beginning of the episode. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The torch has been passed on to us. Physicist and MIT professor Max Tegmark. We should be asking what ultimately we want our future to be like, because you know, 13.8 billion years into our universe, it, it's woken up, it has these conscious entities, and which is wonderful. And, and we managed to understand more and more about how our world works, which has in turn given us great power through technology. And what do we do with that power? Well, we wield it, and why not? It's there. We can use it, and... We do. In the past, we've managed to have the wisdom keep up basically with trial and error. You know, we invented fire, messed up a few times, so we invented the fire <laughs> extinguisher. But with more powerful technology like nuclear weapons, synthetic biology, and future very advanced artificial intelligence, we don't want to learn from mistakes. We want to get it right the first time because it might be the only time we have. 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 What are some of the risks ahead of us? Well, as a species, Homo sapiens have unlocked many secrets, more than any of the hominins that came before us. You know, with those secrets comes great power. And with great power, well, I think you know the rest. Biotechnology, nuclear war, deforestation, fossil fuels, greenhouse gases, global warming, artificial intelligence with goals that conflict with our own, these are just some of the things we face that have never been faced before. Not by any other hominid species before us who went extinct through no fault of their own. Astrophysicist Sir Martin Rees. The great ecologist Ear Wilson says that if our actions caused mass extinction, it's a sin that future generations will least forgive us for. Is extinction inevitable? In 2010, 
noted microbiologist Frank Fenner gave the human species 100 more years. But there's hope. There's always hope. That's another thing our species is exceptionally well at. So on the bigger picture, what do we do? As a species, what do we do? How do we, how do we stop this terrible trend um, with us becoming the most deadly species that ever existed? I believe that uh, modern technology and all our attributes can combine to do, to, to do something about it. What can we do? Educate. And we have some of the most powerful tools ever developed to help us. But I think that the internet is really key, and particularly with children, because we should use that extended childhood to teach our children what is happening and what's going on and that they must do something about it. If we even get 50% of the kids to understand what's going on, in less than 20 years, you have a big body of adults who are really committed to doing something and, and um, changing things. And so I think we have to use all our attributes, our language and our technology and everything to make sure that we continue as a species. And there we have it. Threats and worries about extinction, hope, education, the desire to love and be loved, to be safe. These are big concepts, but they're not new ones. They feel big when you say them out loud, but the problems we as a species face can be tackled if we start small. We live on this one tiny planet. It has this thin film of life around it, which sustains life. We have to preserve that. We have a common origin in Africa. We're one species. We are here and we have to work together and that's important. So let us not join our ancestors in extinction. Let us go forward as one of the most extraordinary species that ever lived and one of the most positive species that ever lived on this earth. Thank you very much. And I can't possibly say it better than that. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Evolution Talk. I'm Rick Ghost, and if you find value in this show, please consider supporting it at evolutiontalk.com. I'd love to keep the show alive without ads, and I can only do so with your assistance. Help spread the word. Share the show with some friends. At evolutiontalk.com, you will find more information, show notes, recommended books, and also ways to contact me. I'd love to hear from you. I hope your week is going well, and until next time, please take care of yourself. Evolution Talk is a Rick Coast production. I have always known about man. From the evidence, I believe his wisdom must walk hand in hand with his idiocy. His emotions must rule his brain. He must be a warlike creature who gives battle to everything around him. Even himself.